This Brigham Young University devotional by President Merrill J. Bateman and Sister Marilyn Bateman was given January 8, 2002. 2002 finds President and Sister Bateman beginning their seventh year of leadership at Brigham Young University. You probably know by now of President Bateman's service to the church, including service as the presiding bishop and as a current member of the first quorum of the 70. You may also know of his academic achievements. You may know of Sister Bateman's church service as a stake young women's president and a stake relief society counselor. But what you may not know about President and Sister Bateman is just how much they care about Brigham Young University and how much they love the students who are here and the young people of the church around the world. They are warm and gracious. I have watched both of them when I felt I was on the brink of personal fatigue, muster the energy and enthusiasm to meet new faces, to, st to tell the story of this great university to others, and to share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are both captivating teachers with profound insights and counsel, and each has a wonderful sense of humor that truly makes any challenge a molehill. President Bateman is a man with vision, a vision of this university as part of the mountain of the Lord's house, with all nations coming up to learn here on Temple Hill, coming because of our quest for knowledge and for truth in every secular and spiritual dimension. I know well how President Bateman sees the potentials and possibilities, not only for the university, but for all of us who work and study here. And I know Sister Bateman's wisdom, support, and encouragement is the perfect helpmate to her husband. I know how much they both love the Lord and seek to serve him. I know also that we will be richly blessed by their messages this morning. President and Sister Bateman. As Sister Rogers introduced us and talked about our feelings for the young people here at the university and also around the world, a thought just came to me. And it was some special feelings I've been having lately as I say my prayers. And I come to the point in my prayers where I ask God to bless the prophet and his counselors and the 12 and the leaders of the church. And then I ask him to bless the missionaries and the members. And lately, as I've got to the missionaries and the members, these very strong feelings come in terms of the incredible opportunity and blessing that is in our lives to reach out and help other people. And I see you and I see all the members of the church as an incredible force across this earth for good. And I have all these warm feelings as that goes through me. It's wonderful to see so many gathered here today, the large number we have in the Marriott Center. And Sister Bateman and I extend our welcome at the beginning of this new year. The attendance at devotionals during the last semester was exceptional. As many students, faculty, and staff responded to the challenge given on that fateful September day, September 11th. The devotionals are an important part of the BYU experience. They add significantly to the spirit on campus and provide a weekly opportunity for all of us to ponder the meaning of life and reflect on ways in which we may improve. Again, I encourage everyone to recommit to attend this semester. Safeguard the 11 a.m. hour each Tuesday to be in the Marriott Center. Today, Sister Bateman and I wish to focus on the Savior and the process by which he grew spiritually during his mortal sojourn, during his life on this earth. The process he followed is no different than the one he has asked us to follow. Hopefully, the presentation will inspire and motivate you to apply the principles that are outlined and that we discuss. In the rural towns of Galilee, Jesus often frequented the synagogues and took occasion to teach. He was a well-known teacher at the temple in Jerusalem as well. Each time he taught, those who listened were astonished by his knowledge, 
of the scriptures. They were astonished by the clarity of his doctrine and the authority with which he spoke. The impact of his teaching is typified by the words of Mark. During the early part of his ministry, as he was teaching in Capernaum, Mark records that Jesus went straightway on the Sabbath day into the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Jesus' first opportunity to teach in the temple at Jerusalem occurred when he was still a boy. At 12 years of age, he accompanied his parents to the feast of the Passover to celebrate Israel's deliverance from Egypt. When the time came to return home, Joseph and Mary believed that he was with relatives in another part of the company. After a day's journey, they learned that he was not with their kinsfolk and returned to Jerusalem to find him. After three days of searching, they located him in the temple, quote, sitting in the midst of the doctors, and they were hearing him and asking him questions and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers, close quote. Even at 12 years of age, his spiritual understanding and maturity was well beyond his years. 18 years later, again at Passover, Jesus entered the temple at Jerusalem once more. On this occasion, he cleansed the temple of those selling merchandise and taught the gathered Jews about his atonement death and resurrection by citing scripture. Even those closest to him, however, did not understand the full import of his sermon until after the resurrection. But again, they were amazed with his knowledge of the doctrine. On another occasion, Jesus returned to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, he taught at the temple. John records the following, quote, the Jews marveled saying, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned?" Close quote. What was meant by this paradoxical question? On the one hand, he demonstrated the same knowledge as a man of letters, but on the other, he had never learned. What did they mean? What did they mean when they said, how knoweth this man letters? Those who interacted with Jesus quickly grasped that he was fully conversant with the law, the scriptures, and the doctrine. His knowledge of the prophets and their words exceeded that of the Pharisees and scribes as he confounded them on numerous occasions. On the other hand, the Jews saw him as one, quote, having never learned, close quote. What did they mean by this phrase? Jesus, unlike Paul, had never sat at the feet of Gamaliel or any other celebrated teacher he had not been a student in the Jewish system of higher education. Therefore, how could he have acquired such profound knowledge? Today, Sister Bateman and I will address the question of how Jesus grew spiritually and then try to illustrate the importance of searching and pondering the scriptures as part of not only Jesus' spiritual growth, but our own. First, Sister Bateman will discuss three ways by which Jesus grew spiritually. Second, I will illustrate the importance of searching and pondering the scriptures as part of the growth process, a process that each one of us must also attempt. Actually, there is a fourth element which contributed to Jesus' spiritual maturation, which will not be discussed today. It is the atonement. The Apostle Paul said that Jesus, quote, learned obedience by the things which he suffered, close quote. In other words, the atoning process was an incredible learning experience. But that is a subject for another day. Sister Bateman. Brothers and sisters, I also extend my welcome this morning. A new year and a new semester presents opportunities to rededicate our efforts to becoming more Christ-like, to lift others and to lighten burdens and to increase our faith. 
My subject today concerns the steps taken by the Savior that increased his spiritual understanding and faith. Just as the Lord's physical growth followed a natural sequence, so did his spiritual progress, although the latter was accelerated. <clears throat> what were the keys, key elements that defined the Savior's growth? As John the Baptist stated, quote, he received not of the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace, close quote. In a similar vein, Luke states that as Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, he also, quote, increased in favor with God and with man, close quote. What was the process? First, like every child, he was taught by his parents. Joseph and Mary had been specially prepared to teach him. He was in their home and under their tutelage for more than half of his life. They had special knowledge concerning who he was and what his earthly ministry was to be. Both of them knew of his divine sonship. They had, they had been taught by the angel Gabriel of his mission and his destiny. They had been taught about his atonement, that he was the Messiah who had been prophesied for for centuries. And Mary knew that his mercy and salvation would last from generation to generation. With little doubt, Mary and Joseph were knowledgeable and highly effective teachers during the Savior's early years. Second, Knowing the identity of his father and his purpose on earth, it is reasonable to assume that Jesus learned much through prayer and also the power of the Holy Ghost. Undoubtedly, he was taught to pray as a young boy, a practice that he continued throughout his adulthood. The importance of prayer in his life is illustrated by the fact that he began his ministry with 40 days of pra uh, prayer and fasting in the wilderness, and concluded with a night of agony and prayer in the garden. Often he sought the privacy of the mountains to pray. After one of those moments, a disciple, having watched him plead, pled to the Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus clearly pointed out to his listeners that the doctrine he taught was not his, but came from God. Only through prayer and the Holy Ghost could he have known this truth. Jesus received the Holy Ghost following baptism, and then he heard his Father's voice declare his divine sonship. Luke records that, quote, heaven was opened at that time which suggests that the Father and the Son enjoyed a close working relationship. The Apostle John speaks of this relationship as follows, quote, God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand, close quote. <clears throat> In other words, Jesus was given a fullness of the Holy Ghost following his baptism again indicating that access to the Father was uninhibited. The Savior's learning process was orderly in that he received line upon line, precept upon precept, but the process was accelerated and highly compressed because of his righteousness, his talents, and his capacity. In contrast, our learning is also line upon line, precept upon precept, but we are given here a little and there a little. We are, not all, we are not given all things at once. In contrast to the Savior's experience, the Holy Ghost is given by measure to us, and our access to spiritual truths increases as we increase in faith, repent of our sins, and learn to be obedient. For us, a lifetime or more may be required to receive the Holy Ghost in its fullness. But again, like the Savior, we do have access to the Holy Ghost to help us grow spiritually. Third, 
Christ was a student of the scriptures. I believe that uh, scriptorial study was a major contributor to his knowledge of spiritual truths. If he was to understand our learning process in mortality so that he could succor us, then it was essential that he learn in like manner. The evidence is strong that he was diligent in searching the scriptures prior to his ministry. Jesus' first sermon in Nazareth is a demonstration of his familiarity with the Old Testament, which was the scripture of his day. He deliberately chose Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 to announce his divine sonship to those in the synagogue. The passage reads, quote, He, Spirit of the Lord, is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to, the, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable day of the Lord." Close quote. Following the reading, Jesus told the congregation that he was the fulfillment of the passage. The Jewish leaders understood the meaning of the verses. They knew that Mos uh, Isaiah's words were a direct reference to the Messiah. For them, Jesus' claim to be the fulfillment was blasphemous. Is not this Joseph's son, they said? Jesus then likened himself to Elijah and Elijah and said, quote, no prophet is accepted in his own country, close quote. The Jews were enraged by his use of the scriptures and attempted to kill him. Another illustration of his familiarity with the scriptures is the story of Jesus and the two men on the road to Emmaus following his crucifixion and resurrection. It was Sunday, the day of the Lord's resurrection, and the two men were discussing their recent events. The Savior approached and joined them. Luke indicates that the eyes of the two men were holden, that they should not know him. Jesus asked them why they were so sad. They in turn questioned him, suggesting that he must be a stranger in those parts if he was not aware of the events concerning Jesus of Nazareth. The two men then repeated for the master the particulars of the trial, the crucifixion, and their disappointment that because they had thought Jesus was the one who would redeem Israel. They concluded by telling the story of his reported resurrection. Women of their company had visited the tomb earlier that morning and found it empty. Angels reportedly told them that Jesus was alive. They were astonished by the women's report and did not know what to make of it. After listening to their recitation, Jesus said, quote, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself." Close quote. Jesus used the scriptures to teach the two disciples the purpose of his mission and the necessity of his death and resurrection as part of the plan of salvation. The prophetic words of the Lord's servants had pointed to these three days. All of the prophets from Moses to Malachi had looked forward to the atoning events and had written about them. Later that evening, after the scales had fallen from their eyes and they recognized their Master and Lord, Jesus vanished from their sight, and the two men then, then said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Jesus knew the scriptures. His familiarity with them was earned through study and prayer. He became a student as a boy, and familiarity with the scriptures increased throughout his life. He was the Jehovah of the Old Testament. The heavens were open to him 
because of his righteousness and his understanding of and the familiar, familiarity with the scriptures came quickly through prayer and the Holy Ghost. I testify, brothers and sisters, that scriptural study was a key element in the Savior's growth from grace to grace. Likewise, time invested in the scriptures will pay huge dividends for us. Our spiritual progress will be shaped by our familiarity with God's words as revealed through the prophets. May each of us commit a few minutes daily to that study is my prayer in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus was not only a student of the scriptures himself, but commanded that we join with him in that pursuit. He said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. From the beginning of time, God has directed the affairs of his children and mortality through prophets. Their inspiration has been written down for the benefit of the believer. According to the Apostle Paul, these written words have been passed from one generation to another for the purpose of declaring doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, or as Christ said, for a testimony of his divinity and understanding of his mission that we might have eternal life. By illustration and commentary, I wish to help you to appreciate the spiritual power and understanding that await you if you are willing to pay the price of becoming a diligent student of the scriptures. In a direct statement of the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord declared why reading and studying the scriptures can be a revelatory experience. In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 18, verses 34 to 36, the Lord, speaking of the Book of Mormon and all scripture, said, These words are not of men nor of man, but of me. Wherefore you shall testify they are of me, for it is my voice which speaketh them unto you, for they are given by my spirit, and by my power you can read them one to another. Wherefore you can testify that you've heard my voice and know my words. In this passage, the Lord states that when reading the scriptures, one may f f hear his voice, feel his spirit, and know his words. Now I turn to the New Testament and the Gospel of John, where we will examine a few scriptures and ponder their meaning in order to understand better the Apostle's message concerning Christ. All of us are familiar with the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three are known as the Synoptic Gospels because they see alike. That is, they are similar in approach and use much of the same material. These three Gospels bear witness of Christ through a narrative beginning with his birth and ending with his death and resurrection. The Gospel of John, on the other hand, is different. Ninety-two percent of the material in John is not found in the other three Gospels. Rather than tell the story of Jesus' life, John employs key events to teach Gospel truths. The LDS Bible Dictionary indicates that the four books were written for different audiences. The dictionary states, quote, it appears from internal evidence of each record that Matthew was written to persuade the Jews that Jesus is the promised Messiah. To do so, he cites several Old Testament prophecies and speaks repeatedly of Jesus as the son of David, thus emphasizing his royal lineage. Mark appeals to a Gentile audience and is fast moving emphasizing the doings more than the sayings of the Lord. Luke offers his readers a polished literary account of the ministry of Jesus, presenting Jesus as the universal savior of both Jews and Gentiles. But John's account does not contain much of the fundamental information that the other records contain. And it is written, and it is evident that he was writing to members of the church who already knew basic information about the Lord. His primary purpose was to emphasize the divine nature of Jesus as the only begotten Son of God in the flesh. Close quote. 
As noted, John appears to have been written for members of the church who have an understanding of basic gospel principles and who Jesus is. With this context in mind, what did John want the members of the church to know? We do not have time to discuss the entire book, but a brief review of the first five chapters will be helpful in answering the questions. The first chapter of John presents testimonies of who Jesus is. Through the Doctrine and Covenants and the Gospel of John, we know that the primary testimonies in that first chapter are those of John the Beloved and John the Baptist. A knowledge of the Godhead and the plan of salvation is required to fully appreciate the first chapter. The first verse indicates that Jesus was in the beginning, that he was with God, that he was God. To fully appreciate the meaning of this verse, a knowledge of the pre-mortal world and the relationship between the Father and the Son is necessary. Jesus was the firstborn in the Spirit and lived in the world of spirits with the Father before coming to earth. Because of his righteousness, the light within him, and his anointing, he was a God. As such, Jesus was the creator of all things, as noted in the third verse. We know through other scriptures, including modern revelation, that Jesus did create all things under the direction of the Father. Verses 4 through 9 state that Jesus is the source of life and light for every man and woman. We know that the light of Christ is given to every person that comes into the world to help them know right from wrong. We also know through modern revelation that the light of Christ is the ultimate source of light and energy for the sun, for the stars, and for the earth. Jesus is the source of light and life. Perhaps the most important verse in chapter 1 is verse 14. It reads, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Only Latter-day Saints fully understand and appreciate the meaning of the phrase, the only begotten of the Father in the flesh. Jesus, as a person in the pre-mortal world, was the spirit offspring of heavenly parents. For his earthly parents, however, Jesus had an immortal father and a mortal mother. Through his mother, he received mortal seeds, which allowed him to die. Through his father, he inherited immortal genes, which allowed him to live forever, if he so chose. On one occasion, he told the Jews, For as the Father hath life in himself, so he hath given to the Son to have life in himself. On another occasion, Jesus said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Although the Romans nailed Jesus to the cross, his death was of his own volition. As Paul said, he had the power of an endless life. He did not have to die. He was the son of an immortal being, his death was a voluntary sacrifice. From his mother, he had the power to lay down his life. From his father, he could take it up again. That is why the atonement is infinite and eternal. It was performed by an infinite and eternal being. Although there is much we do not understand about the atonement, a knowledge of Christ's relationship to the Father clarifies the source of his power to accomplish it. Also, a knowledge of the mortality within him helps us understand the tremendous pain and suffering he endured to atone for our sins. The first chapter concludes with other testimonies that Jesus is the Messiah. John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God. In other words, he is the sacrificial lamb for all mankind. Andrew and Philip also bear witness. This wonderful chapter is an introduction to Jesus as the Redeemer of the world. It teaches us of his divinity and the source of his power. The second chapter is con concerned with Jesus' mission and purpose on earth. He is the promised Messiah whose mission is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man to accomplish the atonement. 
two key statements in the second chapter illustrate that Jesus knew at the beginning of his ministry what the end would be. To the story used by John to illustrate these truths is the marriage feast at Cana. Jesus and his disciples enter Cana on the third day of the week to attend a marriage, a marriage celebration to which they've been invited. During the feast, the host and hostess run out of wine. The Savior's mother then approaches Jesus and asks for help. His response, Woman, what wilt thou have me to do for thee? That will I do. For mine hour is not yet come. Jesus agreed to the request made by his mother, but noted that his actions would relate to his hour, even though that hour had not yet come. What was Jesus' hour? In numerous references, it is the time in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross. His hour is the time during which he performed the atonement. After asking the servants to fill six water pots to the brim, water pots used for cleansing and purifying, he tells them to draw out and take to the governor, who asks why the good wine has been kept until now. John then states, quote, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. As stated earlier, the glory of the Father and the Son is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. How did the conversion of water to wine relate to his hour? What did the conversion signify? What did the wine represent? There are a number of parallels that might be drawn. The power to convert water to wine might parallel the power of Christ's atonement to change men and women from mortal to immortal beings, to transform corruptible bodies into incorruptible ones, to create an inseparable connection between body and spirit in the resurrection. In short, the miracle of Cana not only illustrated Christ's power to change the earthly element of water to wine, but also his power to cleanse and purify, to lift men and women from mortality to immortality, from an earthly to a celestial state. The miracle was connected with his hour and did show forth his glory. The third chapter of John is concerned with the introductory ordinances of the church. After introducing Christ in chapter 1 and confirming the purpose of his mission in chapter 2, John turns to the basic ordinances required for members to participate in the blessings of the atonement. The story is that of Nicodemus, the Jewish leader coming to Christ by night, asking what he must do in order to enter into the kingdom of God. He is told that he must be born again of water and of the Spirit. He must be baptized by immersion for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 4 then describes what a member following baptism should do to stay on the path to eternal life. The chapter tells the story of Christ meeting the Samaritan woman at the well and telling her of living water, which quenches one's thirst forever. Christ is the fountain of living waters, and those who drink from his well will never thirst. The water is a symbol for his words, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The water is also linked to the sacrament in our day which reminds us that we must internalize his words by taking his name upon us and by keeping his commandments. The fifth chapter of John is the story of Jesus healing the sick at Bethesda. It's my favorite chapter. For me, the story has great meaning. The scriptures read, Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. 
When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he'd been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man to help me when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. Why did John include this story in the, in the gospel? To what ordinance, covenant, or promise does this miracle refer? Will there come a day when Jesus tells each of us to rise, walk, and be made whole? One of the great blessings that awaits all of mankind is the glorious resurrection, the opportunity to re be redeemed from the bands of physical death, a time when each person will be given power to restore the sleeping dust unto its perfect frame, bone to his bone and the sinews and the flesh upon them. As Jesus lifted the blanket covering the lame man, so he will lift the blanket of the grave in a future day, allowing us to rise in the newness of life through the power of his atonement and resurrection. When that day comes, no man or woman will be able to say, I have no man to help me. As the lame man at Bethesda was made whole, so we in the resurrection will experience the greatest healing of all as spirit and element are inseparably connected and receive a fullness of joy. The 1883 Karl Block painting of Christ healing the sick at Bethesda now hangs in the BYU Museum of Art. It is a masterpiece. It is a signature piece for this campus as it portrays the Lord as healer and comforter both in time and eternity. I encourage you to visit the museum and see it. I encourage you to ponder its message. Brothers and sisters, do you feel the beauty and power of the scriptures? Can you sense the blessings that await if you drink deeply of Christ's living water? Will you set aside a few minutes each day to read from the scriptures and then ponder the meaning of the verses read. When the day comes for us to stand before the keeper of the gate, the Holy One of Israel, it is my prayer that he will not perceive in us a slowness of heart to believe that which the prophets have said. Rather, may he see us as men and women of spiritual letters, having learned day by day over a lifetime. May each of us prepare to meet him, is my prayer in his holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Brigham Young University devotional by President Merrill J. Bateman and Sister Marilyn Bateman was given January 8th, 2002.